All right. Thank you for that warm welcome. Good to be with you all the way from Canada. Yes. Uh, 150 years yesterday, July 1st is Canada Day. So some of you are like, oh, I got houses that old. Uh, so we're, <laughs> but uh, July 4th for you guys. So happy America Day or whatever you call it. Um, all right. So uh, here's what I'm going to do. Um, uh, Isaiah 61 is where we're going to be. So if you've got a Bible, open up to Isaiah 61. Um, that's in the Old Testament for those of you who are maybe new exploring Christianity. Good to have you guys here. Um, uh, really, there are a bunch of Bible texts that could define a life. And the reality is, as I've searched the Bible, I've found that Isaiah 61 is a really good one. There's a particular verse, verse 1, that I'm going to speak about today that kind of defines out the why and the what and the how of life in general and what we're called by God to do. And so in Isaiah 61, verse 1, it says this. Starts this way. It says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Now, uh, right there, we have this fascinating thing that kind of counters what our natural tendency would be in life, which is if we're going to do anything powerful or meaningful in our life at all, it's going to come from us trying harder. Right? That's what we tend to do. If we can just kind of work harder, get up earlier, pull up our moral bootstraps, then we can really make something work. We can really make impact. And so New Age philosophy tells us that. We're told that when we turn on the radio or watch TV, the power's within you. Don't you know you're a good person? You can just work harder and you can really make impact and do something for the world. The problem is Isaiah comes out of the gate and he says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, meaning if the power doesn't actually come from you, it comes through you from God from somebody outside of yourself, which is extremely humbling because it says no matter how hard you work at something, God's actually the one who's going to do it. Now, some of you need to hear the message that's a bit of the opposite of that right now, which is because, of course, that message tells you that it's not about you. It's about him, and he's going to be the one who actually changes the things around you. But some of you actually aren't working hard enough. And I get to speak at enough conferences with enough church leaders where sometimes I look out at pastors and I say to myself, man, these guys got into ministry. Probably it seems like because there's, you know, some, they wanted to get in a warm space and drink some coffee and there was no heavy lifting in ministry at all. So instead of, you know, doing that, to do instead was, sorry, my mic was kind of banking out there. Um, what they decided to do instead of kind of, hey, uh, doing hard work is they got into ministry and they became a pastor because they thought it would be easy. Uh, and so what I get to do is get up and say, listen, there's a reason that the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 2 says, if you want to get into ministry, you got to be an athlete, a farmer, and a soldier. Now, listen, you ever met a farmer? Those dudes get up early, man. Those guys aren't rolling into work at 10 a.m. All right, that's hard work to be an athlete, a farmer, a soldier is the image that you and I are in the midst of a war. We're in the midst of a spiritual war where every single day there is a fight for our worldview, our mind, our heart. I have uh, three daughters that I'm trying to raise in Vancouver, which is the west coast of Canada, 11, 9, and 6 years old. And every single day, it is a fight for me to be able to get them to understand what God calls them to do versus what the world calls them to do. And my family looks at me every time I sit down at night and read my girls a Bible story or pray with them, tell them about Jesus, bring them to church. I didn't grow up in a Christian home at all. And so my family looks in at me and they say, you know, Mark, what you're doing with those girls is you're brainwashing them. And you know what I say every single time my family tells me I'm brainwashing my girls? You're darn right I am. Because if I don't, you will. Right? Or Grey's Anatomy will. Or, you know, whatever. It's, it's, it's because this is what it'll do. Hey, girls, this is what sexuality is. This is what womanhood is. This is what power is. This is how you're supposed to use your body. This is how you're going to define life. And the Apostle Paul says, you're in the midst of a war every single day to be able to define reality for people, to be able to disciple people's minds, be able to understand, which means a bunch of us need to start getting up earlier. A bunch of us actually need to go, I gotta get some discipline in my life because when it comes to Christianity, I just mail it in, man. It's a weekend thing. It's something kind of, it's, it's a sphere of my life. It's kind of the stuff I believe. It affects kind of what I think about this, but it doesn't affect what I think about money or sex or how I raise my family. It's none of those things. It's just kind of over here. And the reality is some of us need to hear the message of Paul that you need to be more intentional. Now, some of you, that's the message you need to hear. Many of us in here, though, need to hear this. No matter how hard you work, the power is not going to come from you. 
It comes through you. The sp- he says this, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. That's the power that we have in our life at all. That's the thing God's trying to do in our life is he's trying to bring that in. Now, here's the reality. Um, there's a lot of you in here that would say to yourself, you don't understand, God could never use me. It doesn't matter if the power comes to the spirit. I'm such a wreck. I'm such a disaster. Mark, you have no idea what I did last night. You have no idea what I did this week. You have no idea. God could never use me to do anything amazing. Listen, I am the poster. I am here to tell you there is hope for you. I am the poster boy for God could never use me. It could never. Listen, I grew up in an atheistic home, uh, meaning there was no church, no Bible, no God, no prayer, no anything. So my father was such an ardent atheist. I have a brother. He's four years older than me. His name is Matthew. He made my mom spell his name with one T because in the Bible, it's spelt with two T's and he didn't want to be biblical. And then four years later, named me Mark. (laughs) Like literally didn't understand the irony of that. Like never open up a Bible, all right? Literally, if I had a brother, he'd be like, let's name him Luke. I think that's a good name. (laughs) He had never even thought, like literally, that's the house I grew up in. No God, no church, no Bible, no prayer, nothing. And uh, when I was uh, nine years old, my parents got divorced. And, uh, and, I, and it kind of hit me so hard psychologically that I developed something called Tourette Syndrome. All right, now for those of you who know what Tourette Syndrome is, it's a way not to be cool in high school. All right, it is literally uh, something where uh, the doctor tells me that I went through such a psychological trauma that, that I started developing tics and habits. And so you'll see up here my kind of my face and my body twitches around a little bit. And so that's because I went through this thing when I was nine years old. And what happened to me is uh, I would develop, like you've seen maybe shows with people with Tourette's where they just randomly swear at people. That's what I was doing when I was a kid growing up. I would just like, F! I just swear randomly at people. I just, F bomb. I wouldn't say the word F. I'm saying that to you because you're all good Christians. You're like, why is he saying the alphabet F? I don't understand. Listen. Um, And so I would literally be sitting in high school in a room. It would be a gymnasium. And it'd be dead silent because we'd be all 400 of us writing an exam. And it'd be like, F! All right? And everyone's like, no! Come on, Mark. Pull it together, man. Now, here's the thing. Here's the one job you're never going to get when you randomly swear at people. A pastor. A pre, like a a preacher. It does, it's not going to work. You can't do that. God loves you, has a wonderful plan. Right, that's not going to, craziest church ever. 18A, you can't get in, you got to show your ID. That's not going to work. The only way that will ever work is if God shows up. And the spirit of the Lord God decides to descend and do something with an unlikely, messed up human being. He loves, here's the thing, God loves to use morons like me, all right? And that's biblical. 1 Corinthians 1, I'm going to take the foolish things of the world. That's the Greek word moron, foolish, literally. That's what it says. This is what he likes to do. He likes to take unlikely people and actually use them in ways that they could never dream of. You're saying, oh, God can never use. Listen, my father passed away when I was 15. Uh, He was 47 years old of lung cancer. Never called me, never told me that he was going to, uh, that he was dying. Never told me he was sick. The hospital called and said, hey, you need to come. Your dad's dying. And so we we, we, we planned to go the next day. They called us and said, don't bother coming. He's already passed away. And I sat in his funeral. And uh, I looked into the casket and I started asking the big questions of life. Origins, meaning, morality, destiny, sexuality, where we came from, how science could jive with faith, how the exclusive, the exclusive message of Christianity, how offensive that is. What about hell? What about, and all of these questions, the problem of evil and suffering, all these questions started rising in me. And that's what the book that uh, Andrew was talking about, is about the problem of God, is, is it's my journey through going through the history, the science, the philosophy of Christianity and coming 
coming to realize that Christianity is the best idea in the marketplace of ideas. It connects with philosophy, psychology, history, science, and it's the 10 skeptical questions that people ask against Christianity and equipping us to be able to answer and wrestle those questions to the ground, right? And so literally, this is what I started to deal with in my life and started to come to the conclusions. Now, Here's the other thing. When I was uh, 29 years old, God called me to plant a church in Vancouver, which kind of sucks because there's no Christians in Vancouver, right? <laughs> there's no Christians in Canada. So I'm like, well, I don't want to plant a church. This isn't going to work. Uh, this is, uh, there was a magazine, national magazine named McLean's Magazine. Uh, it did an article. It said, how Canadian are you? And here's what it found. It asked a bunch of questions to thousands of Canadians, and it found that 30% of Canadians were most uncomfortable around evangelical Christians. The same percentage as other top untouchables, like drug addicts and child abusers. All right? That's how Canada views Christianity. And God's like, hey, fool, good morning. I want you to plant a church there. And I'm like, I don't want, nobody likes Jesus. Now, everyone's vaguely spiritual, like California, all right? Everyone, you know, does yoga, wears Lululemon pants, eats kale, <laughs> drinks a water bottle, vaguely spiritual. They think that's a thing. They think the universe is talking to them. They think if they think enough nice thoughts and they put a boat on their fridge and say, boat, 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 that the universe has to give that nonsense back to them, all right? That's... What all of Vancouver thinks. And now I got to get up and tell them that that's not true, that that's humanistic, that that's a philosophy that comes from pagan ideas. And Jesus actually came as a person and died for them because they're such a disaster. They're a wreck. They are sinful. They can't save themselves. Now they're all put together. They all think that their life's perfect. I love what Jesus says, very encouraging, Revelation 3, uh, you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I love that stuff. Like, that's literally what my church hears every week. You come, now, if we get a building, we don't own a building yet. We need $30 million to build a building that we're trying to find right now. So I don't know if you guys have any extra, let me know. Um, <laughs> but if we ever get a building... We're going to put over the top of the auditorium that verse. You are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Welcome to Village Church. That's the vibe we want to set up because here's what it does. The more you get ground down, the more Jesus looks big. The more Jesus looks great. And the more you start to go, man, he can call me to do big things even though I'm a messed up person. He can use messed up people imperfect people, people like you and me. Listen, my wife and I were driving up to do a marriage retreat recently. We were gonna, there was 300 people at our church and we're gonna do a marriage retreat and we're gonna teach them how to do marriage right. So we're driving up on the way up there to Whistler, which is about two hours from where we live, driving up and she's like, hey, what are we gonna talk about tonight? And I said something perfect and great. I said, well, I'll do a bunch of talking. You just chime in. That's not a good thing to say, all right? So my wife and I get in a fight. Of course, all right? We just start fighting, like scrapping in the car on the way to teach a bunch of people how to do marriage right. You shut up, you shut up. No, you shut up, you don't understand. No, you don't understand. And then she did one of these on me, if you guys have ever experienced this. She looks out the window and goes quiet, silent on me. And I'm driving, I'm like, okay, okay, what's, what's this? I gotta teach people about communication and conflict and the five principles of love and respect. And now you look it out and I'm here. Oh my goodness, so it's quiet for a while. So I did something I haven't done in years. If you doubt the existence of God, by the way, uh, th this may help. I did something I haven't done in years. I turned on the radio. Like I'm talking about the old school like radio, where like there's these things that vibe into like this pole on the front of your car and they like, and it's like just stuff that you didn't choose. It's just there and you have to listen to it, all right? That radio, like literally haven't turned it on in three years, all right? So it's silent, so I turn on the radio. I'm not kidding you. The song that was playing on the radio was the song that we danced to on our wedding day, all right? I'm not joking. Baby, you're all that I want when you're lying here in my arms. I'm finding it hard to believe we're in heaven. <laughs> like, we did, we did one of these to that. And it's like coming through the radio. And because I'm closer to the Lord, my heart melts. All right? 
And I start to go, oh man, I, I, you know, I'm coming to know Christ. I'm repenting of sin. I've recognized my folly. And I'm not joking as the Lord's speaking to me because I can hear him. She, out of this, my side, I just see her arm come around and go, boop, and shut it off. And she just keeps staring out the window, man. And I'm just praying for her wicked soul. This lady's messed up. So here's the crazy thing. Then we get up to this marriage retreat and marriages get changed. How is that possible? Because he uses imperfect people like you and all your mess and all your selfishness and all your narcissism to do something not because of you, but in spite of you. This is what, so I'm 29 years old, I'm in a hoodie, and my only plan to plant this church is just to get up and scream at everybody for an hour about the Bible. Now, that's not a plan in Canada, because what they say you have to do in Canada is everyone's going to get so offended. So you got to talk in pear-shaped tones and have conversation and a dialogue with people. And I'm like, well, that doesn't sound very fun. So we planted this church, 16 people in my house. And I just got up and started teaching the Bible. And literally, there was no plan. I just get up and this is what I do still, is I just choose a biblical book and I preach through it verse by verse by verse by verse. Right now, we as a church, we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew for three years. And we're in chapter 20, verse 16. Right? There's day, I just get up and preach verse 16a. All right, that's it. That's it for the day. Goodbye. There's no plan. But here's what started to happen, even though it was all simplistic. People started coming to know Jesus. <clears throat> people started to repent of sin. People started going, my goodness, he doesn't talk to us in pear-shaped tones. He screams at us to repent. He calls us wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked, disaster. Don't you understand? You're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe he talks to us like that. i got to bring a friend. And they all started bringing their friends. <laughs> And then their friends started to come to know Jesus. And people started to get off drugs and their marriages started. People started to get baptized. And so this little room starts to kind of expand out. And then we don't have any more room. So we had to go to two services. The dreaded two service. All right. And this, this lady walks up to me. She's like, we cannot go to two services. Don't you understand? This is going to kill our church. It's going to be the nail in our coffin. I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, I come here and Jody and I won't be able to hook up for, you know, potlucks anymore. And we're going to build community here. And now we're going to be split up between two services. I can't believe you're going to do this. So I had to get up the next week and I said, listen, we didn't plant a church so that you could get more friends. We planted a church because every day people die and go to hell like my father. And so we're going to do everything in our power to reach as many people as possible. And if you don't want to come back next week because we're going to two services, that's okay. Just go to another church. We don't care. And just by going to two services, we grew by 50 people in a, well, 49. She left. 50, but <laughs> 50 people in a week just by doing that. And so then we kind of started growing again. And then we had to move again. And we had to move places. We did a, uh, uh, a, a service in the park in our city recently, last summer. And there was, so there was 4,000 people gathered in this park. And we're worshiping. And I get up and I preach Jesus. And I tell everybody their life's a disaster. And I tell them, but it's okay because Jesus is good even though you are not. And he came and he died for sin. And he rose for your salvation. And here I'm in this public park in Vancouver. And these people are walking, and so we had about 30 people lined up for baptisms that day. So we have these two baptismal tanks, and we're doing worship, and people are getting baptized. And all of a sudden, people just start to come forward. And we're like, hey, if you want to get baptized, let us know. By the end of the day, 96 people got baptized. 96 people in that one day. There were, there were guys walking up going, dude, my girlfriend and I were at some party. We slept on the couch. We're completely hung over right now. We walked in, we heard you preaching about Jesus, and we want to realign our life and give our life to him. And I'm in the baptismal tank with him. I'm like, bah, bah, go, go, go. I'm like, I don't even know. I don't even know what to do theologically with this. He may be half in the bag right now. But that you can't, listen, when the spirit of God decides to blow, all you can do is keep up. That's, so that's the hope, is that you just get down on your knees and say, we need you to move. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. It's not by my effort. My, um, our, uh, the, the, a couple uh, months ago, uh, we did this. Uh, now, this is a little secret for those of you who might not know about pastors. Sometimes, I know this is hard to believe, you don't really feel like coming out and preaching and being a pastor. Okay, there's some days where I sit, and there was this was one of them. I was sitting backstage, and I was like, man, I just want to get in my car and get out of here. I wonder how long it would take anybody to notice. And so I got out, and I did this sermon that I didn't care about. It was one of these like, hey, 
I don't know, God hates you, do something about it. It was like a Jonah, like a Jonah, like I don't care if any of you repent kind of deal. And walked off stage. We did this debrief after and one of our admin people goes, hey, listen, we got to train our ushers in leading people to Jesus. And I'm like, why would we have to do that? And they're like, I don't know what you said on Sunday, but like nine people randomly just walked up to ushers because they're the only official people and went, can you please lead me into a relationship with the Lord? And our ushers are like, a bucket? All right, they don't, <laughs> they don't know what to do. They're like, hey, we collect the money, man. That's what we do. And then we count it. Right? And so we have to train these people. Why? Because when the Spirit of God shows up, it's just playing keep up. That's your only hope. The power doesn't come from you. It comes from him. Now, that's the how. That's how you're going to have any power in your life at all. It's going to come from the Spirit. Now, let's think about this. What is the, 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 the next thing he says? Uh, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. So what is the what, is the what of your life? The what of your life is, the, that's the word, you know what the word good news means? What is it? It's gospel. And so the what of your life, the center of your life, this is very important, is that you're supposed to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Now, that is not what we tend to think it is. Because oftentimes, I talk to people who grew up in the church, and what they think church is about, what they think the message of the Bible is about, is about being a good person. Just be a good person. If you're a good person, then God will love you and accept you. And the whole point of the gospel is you're not a good person, so Jesus had to come and be a good person for you. You cannot earn the favor of God. Now, what we got to understand is once we grab a hold of that message, then it frees us up because you and I are living in a system where we think more about religion than we think about the gospel. We think that if we can perform well, that God will love us more. And that's what you think about when you're reading your devos, when you come to church. If I can just be a good person. And the gospel comes and says, no, you don't understand. I talk to people who left the church after they were past their teen years because they just heard moralistic sermons that told them to do better. And they couldn't do better. They couldn't deal with the sexual temptation. They couldn't deal with the stuff their friends were dealing with, they felt like a bad person, and so they left because religion always crushes you. It always destroys you because what you hear is, hey, you should be like Jesus. You know the problem with the message of you should be like Jesus when it's isolated from the gospel is that it crushes you because you're not Jesus. You know that, right? Like, here's where we've got it wrong. We read the Bible and we, listen, when you're doing your devos in the morning and Jesus hanging out with the prostitutes, who are you in that story every time? You're Jesus. You're like, I shall deal with the prostitutes of my life. I shall minister to my neighbors. No, you're not G You're the prostitute. Every single time you're the prostitute. Because you're the wreck. You, listen, when you're reading the, the book of Hosea, you know, the prophet, and God says, I want you to marry Gomer the prostitute. And you know how you read Hosea? You think you're Hosea. You're like, I shall be righteous and I shall be about. No, you're Gomer. You cheat on Jesus every single day. And yet God is faithful to you, not because of you, but in spite of you. That's what Hosea is about. See, the Bible's not about you. It's about him. If you think it's about you, it will crush you every single time. And so you read Hosea and you go, well, who am I then? I'm the prostitute. And yet God has been faithful every single time, even though I don't deserve it. But when I talk to church people, it's almost an adventure in missing the point every single week. You know that your place in the story is simply to bring the sin that necessitated salvation to happen. That's your role. And then Jesus takes the wrath of God on himself, rises from death to give you life, and then you rest on him. Church people miss the point of this all the time. My, um, I took my uh, family to Disneyland uh, a few months ago, and there was this ride, and it had a two-hour and 45-minute wait to get on this ride. So I thought, my gosh, I'm going to be a good father and model sacrifice for my daughter. 
I said, you go hang out with, you know, your, the, the rest of the family. I will sit in this line for two hours and 45 minutes because I want her to see the sacrifice of a parent. And so she left. I said, I'll text you when I'm close. Two hours, 45 minutes later. I text her, I said, get out here. We're going to come in. She comes, she jumps over the fence. Hey, daddy, gives me a hug. And I'm like, honey, I did this to model sacrificial parenting for you so that you, one day, you know, will do this for your kids, right? And she looked at me, and I'm not kidding you. She said, no, my husband will. <laughs> like, what the I'm talking about? How is it? How young do these women learn this stuff? I'm not kidding. What are you saying? I'll just marry a fool and he'll do it. That's what she, that's what she learned. Adventure in missing the point. We do this with the gospel all the time. You come to church for 10 years and you still think the Bible says, be like Noah. Be like Moses. Be like David. You ever read the story of Noah? He's a drunk. David, have you read David recently? Moses, these guys are all a disaster. God does something not because of them, but in spite of them. Not because they are good, but because he is good. And the quicker we start to understand that reality, the gospel will start to change. Listen to me. Religion wants to change what you do. It wants to look externally and say, do this, do this, do this. Don't watch rated R movies. Don't do this. Don't do this. But do these things. That will never change. Here's what the gospel is about. It's not about changing what you do. It's about changing what you want to do. It's about actually changing your affections, changing what you take pleasure in, changing your entire makeup so that you actually glory. Listen, the only way to defeat a sin is to actually, it's not just to get it out of your life. That will never work. Thomas Chalmers, who's a, a theologian, he wrote something called The Expulsive Power of a new affection. And what he said is the only way to destroy and get away from one affection, say a sin in your life, it's not to just displace it. You have to replace it with something that you love more. That's the only way to defeat a sin. Some of you are trying to defeat porn or being greedy or whatever your sin is, cheating on your spouse, and you're trying to figure out and you're trying to just go, I gotta stop doing this, I gotta stop doing this, I gotta stop doing this. It'll never work because you can't just get rid of a sin. You have to replace it with something that you love more, with something that trumps it. This is why um, when I was growing when I... Uh, I, I smoked for many, many years. Since I was grade eight, I started smoking. And I love smoking. Any smokers in the house? All right. All right. I love smoke. Like, in the morning, after a steak, smoking. So good. How am I ever going to stop this? It's really hard. You know the only way I ever stopped smoking? Listen, they tried religious external motivations, all right? They put, yeah, they, they started putting uh, uh, warnings of what would happen to me. You know, they would put like these rotting teeth on the front, like pictures of them and, and a bleeding brain and like lungs that were corroding. None of it worked. I would just walk up to the convenience store and give me two, give me two donkey teeth and a bleeding brain. I, I didn't care. <laughs> you don't care. You know the only way I stopped smoking? I met a girl. And she thought I was stinky. <laughs> and over time, my affection for her trumped my affection for smoking. You can't just stop. You got to love something more than you love the thing. And for those of you dealing with sin in your life, you got to love Jesus more than you love the sin. That's the only way to ever stop it. That's when the good news starts to actually get into your soul. It actually starts working on your affections, on what you want to do. And this is the what that has to define everything about your life. And then lastly, lastly is the why. He says this, he has sent me, look at this, to bind up the brokenhearted, underline that, brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, Underline captive, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. This is the why of your life. 
Nothing else is going to tell you that the reason you exist on the planet is to bind up the brokenhearted, to find people who are captive and to set them free. That is why you exist. It ain't for square footage. It ain't to have a good marriage. It's not just to raise more money for yourself. You have people all around you who are captive and bound spiritually, emotionally, physically, and your job every morning is to wake up and say, how do I set them free? And here's what that means. It means that your life should be surrounded by messed up, broken people, and not nice, quaint, perfect, safe people, which is exactly our temptation. Our temptation, one guy likes that. Our temptation is to establish life around safe, normal, clean, nice people. That's what our churches are full of. I remember when I first started going to church, I'd read the Bible for two years before I ever walked into a church when I was 19. And when I read the Bible, it was jacked up. And I was like, church is going to be jacked up. Church is going to be insane. Everyone's getting their head cut off, torn apart by lions because the world is not worthy of them. When I go to church, this thing's going to be crazy. I'm going to walk in there. It's going to be like, we're here to just survive. And it's going to be blood up on the screen. And it's going to be, we're going to be singing songs about raw, the death of Christ. And you better figure your life out. Maybe you should survive. I'm reading Jesus and he's like, I send you out like sheep among wolves. Now, just think about that for a sec. Worst shepherd ever. You know what wolves do to sheep? Just rip them apart. Jesus is like, here's my plan for your life. Sheep. That's, I love you. And that's my wonderful plan for your life. I showed up to church. I'm like, this thing's going to be crazy. And I walked in nervous. And everyone was so nice. Everyone was so nice. Hello, welcome, hi, I feel so welcome, good, nice. Would you like this seat or this one or this one or this one? I thought there'd be like flares and whips. Sit down, <laughs> shut up. And there was hummingbirds sucking pollen out of flowers on the worship slides. And I was like, oh, it's so nice to be here. When I started going to church, I didn't sound or look like anyone there. Chain smoker, swear every other word. I didn't know that was wrong. I didn't have any culture for it. So I came in. A guy actually looked at my girlfriend at the time and said, you need to break up with Mark. She said, why? He said, didn't you hear the sermon today? You cannot be unequally yoked. And she's like, I'm not unequally yoked. What are you talking about? How am I unequally? Mark's not a Christian. She said, what are you talking about? He said, I saw him smoking. Not a Christian. And she's like, well, what was he smoking? <laughs> and he's like, oh, cigarette? She's like, it's better than what I used to smoke. Praise God. <laughs> because here's the thing. Listen, here's the thing, man. Don't start with where people are. Ask the question of where they came from. This is supposed to be a place of grace where broken, captive, bound people are getting their life changed by the God of the universe. And that takes time and energy. You look at someone and go, they're not a Christian. Look at them. you got to ask, where are they coming from? People in church culture are so, oh, can you believe what that girl wore to church today? Did she have clothes on? Praise God. <laughs> you don't know where she was a year ago, bro. Messed up bound people like you and me whose lives are not perfect and we need to admit it. When I planted a church, I planted it in a perfect area with perfect people, with perfect homes and perfect cars and perfect marriages. And I said to myself, this will not work because I'm going to get up there and twitch my face around and everyone's going to be like, eh, we like perfection and this ain't going to happen. And so I talked to my mentor. I said, this church plant won't happen. And he said something very profound. He said, it will happen. And I'll tell you why. Because they're going to see you and you're going to give them permission to be broken and messed up. And that's what actually started happening. People then started to recognize that their life has a limp and they are not perfect. And that's why Jesus had to be perfect for them. Listen, some of you are like, yeah, but I'm not a good missionary. I'm not a good leader. God can never use me. Listen, I'm not a good leader. I'm not a good pastor. Between you and me, 
Don't tell my church. I'm a disaster. I'm not good at my job. I'm not. Listen, a little bit ago, I looked at one of our guys and I said, you are the perfect guy. I need you to start a Chinese a community group to reach all the Chinese people in our area. Start a Mandarin-speaking community group. You're going to kill it. You're going to do awesome. He's like, that's a great idea, Mark. Uh, I'm Korean. <laughs> I'm like, I know. What? What? Oh, you thought, no, I know. I just think you'd be good at it. Listen, I once told, this is not a joke, I once told a woman her husband was dead and he wasn't. And I, she mourned his death for 45 minutes before I found out I had the wrong guy. Yeah, I'm, yeah, you can't beat that, by the way. There's no one in this room. You can, I am here to make you feel good about your life right now, all right? You're like, well, never told anybody that someone died that didn't. Perfect, I'm good. And I sat with her as she mourned, and then I found out I had the wrong guy, and I walked back in the room with her, and I'm like, <laughs> so remember that thing we were chatting about? Uh, uh, she's like, you know what? I'm going to see him again in the resurrection. I'm like, actually, it's going to be sooner than that. Uh, now, here's the thing. Here's the crazy thing, man. I was 29 years old. I was three months away from planting my church. And Satan used that to destroy me. I went back into my office after she left, and I'll never forget the look that she gave me. It's etched into my brain, the hatred and confusion. And I sat in my office and stared out the window, and I was, went totally white. And Satan just whispered in my ear, you are playing dress up, bro. You are not mature enough. You are not old enough. You are putting on daddy's clothes and pretending you're a pastor and you think you're going to plant a church in six months? Are you joking me? Everybody that you reach, you're going to hurt. You should not do this. And I need people to come into my life and speak gospel into my life so that I actually still planted this church because I wasn't going to. And it was, dude, listen to me. You are beloved. In you, I am well pleased. Do you recognize the Father declares that down on Jesus at his baptism before he's even done anything yet? You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And some of you in here, you think you're so far gone. You've done too many bad things. God can never use you. You're still functioning in a moralistic framework where you think he's going to use you because you're good. He doesn't. He uses you because he is good. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And your performance, if you are in Christ, does not matter anymore in regard to that because I will use your brokenness for good things. And some of you just doubt that about yourself. And so I want to pray for us to that end. Father, I pray that you would help those of us who are here and we're questioning and we're wondering and we're agnostic and we're atheists or we belong to another religion or we might be Christian, but we're just lost in regard to purpose and meaning and vision for our life, that we would hear from this text the why and the what and the how of what you want us to do as we leave here, that now we've gathered that we would scatter and be on mission for the broken and the captive among us to see them come to know Jesus, to see their lives actually have meaning, that there's people here who just need to hear that because of your grace, that you will use them to do something, not because of them, but in spite of them, in all their brokenness, in all their sin, in all the secret stuff that their spouse and the person sitting beside them don't know about, all of the stuff that has wrecked and destroyed them and makes them feel shame and guilt, that in Jesus they can be freed from it. Because the spirit of the Lord God falls upon us to do something we could never do in our own power. You use the broken things, the silly things, people like me, to have little bits of impact by your grace, and I'm thankful. And if you could use me to do it, you could use anybody sitting here, and I pray that you do. That they would have influence and impact for your glory and for the good of people. In Jesus' great name we pray, amen.